Good evening and most welcome to H719 and I've named this nightly lecture here around the snowy hills in Lindum, south of Gothenburg. Appearance, deceptive or not? Wittgenstein is known to have said once to a friend he met downtown, Tell me, why do people always say that it was natural for man to assume that the sun went around the earth, rather than the earth was rotating? And I think that's an interesting question. And his friend said, just, well, of course, it looks that way. And then Wittgenstein said, how would it look if the earth was rotating? And I think those questions are very apt. What he points here is that when we say that it actually looks like uh, the earth is uh, having the, the sun going around it, we don't really think about those things really carefully. We just say it looked natural. What do we mean when we say that it looked natural? And Wittgenstein, as always, points that out. It's very far from self-evident how it looks when the sun circles the earth or the earth rotates. It's, it's uh, very interesting and you can think about that a long time. And the more you think about it, the more you know it's completely wrong to say it looks like the sun is rotating on the earth. And this is a little bit about the same thing. Carla wanted me to uh, look at these spacious things a little bit. And uh, one thing is also very interesting, and we don't give that much thought, is that Nowadays, well, the last five or six hundred years, it's been taught that the earth is round. And, uh, well, how is it with that? Well, if you make a very flat surface, for instance, you would make a square or maybe you would make some sort of patio. Patio, maybe it's a better one. Patio? You, Patio is a terrace, uh, sort of, oh, yes. a flat surface, so five, five times five meters, something like that, if it's rather big. That will always be flatter if we by flatness mean this being straight than the roundness of the earth. So what we need to think about exactly how round is the earth. And it's very much less round than the word flat. And that's very interesting. Uh, so we get something we never thought about. And actually, I would say we strand with two different uses of the word round. And you can say that the saying that the earth is round is actually putting it into the uh, coordinate system of uh, the, of Cartesius. Then it gets round. But that's a, it's a folly partly because why is that? Yes, you should ask what is the size of the coordinate system? And apparently it doesn't have a size. It's sizeless. So it's a problem here. And uh, we can also look at it in a third way. What was the normal use of the word round before we discovered the earth was round? It was of course an object that you can perceive to be round. Either by touching seeing or inferring in a normal way.
But I would say even to say that the mountain was round would be very far-fetched. Nobody would say that. Even if they went around the mountain and they had some feeling about it being circular in some sense, I don't think they would call it round because round belongs to a certain size of objects. I'm not objecting to the using of roundness to the earth. But we need to be specific here. It's an absolutely new use of the word round. And it doesn't actually have much relationship with the first word. And I think this shows that very clearly. And now it's going to get much worse. We are actually going to talk about the actual, actual percept of space. And no one other than Mr. Immanuel Kant himself, the fantastic philosopher coming from the city of Königsberg, one of the most beautiful cities of the old Prussian Empire. Situated very beautifully uh, on the Baltic, with many, many bridges that Kant in his days all passed on his exercise round. And here we come to an immensely interesting problem, because Kant said that certain things were innate, and he said time and space were in a way innate in experience. It was impossible to experience anything outside space and time. This I uh, can call a priori perception. So it's a perception before perception. And in the space of Kant, the shortest distance between two points was always a straight line. That and many other uh, properties of space was that uh, was it that Kant thought space was. However, and here comes a really big but, remember the circular shape of the sphere. It wasn't until the 19th century that people discovered we can have a completely different geometry and all of a sudden came the birth of the non-Euclidean non-Euclidean geometry and the jot in the non-Euclidean geometry it was not uh, the shortest. The shortest distance between two points were no longer a straight line. It is a rounded line. And nobody knew about that before the event on young Euclidean space. But that is actual space. Space is rounded. It's not flat. So whereas we say that the Earth might not be completely round, uh, well, it doesn't make, uh, from a common language uh, point of view, it doesn't make much sense to say that the Earth is round. But to some extent, I can say the Earth is round. From a mathematical point of view, not founded on Earth. But however, when it comes to non-Euclidean space, that actually pertains to our world. It's not about big objects. And actually what non-Euclidean space showed was that this idea of three dimensions, that doesn't work at all. It's all in our heads. It's not actually out there in real space. 
And can you imagine what enormous consequences? Here you have a famous philosopher walking around in the streets of Königsberg and he thinks he can see space. And this goes back to what I meant originally. Appearance. Is it deceptive or is it not? Well, in the case of Kant, we know it was deceptive. It was not a true space he saw. He saw not what he saw. And that's mighty interesting. How come? Nobody knows uh, what would have happened if Kant would have known about non-Euclidean space. I think his old philosophy would have crashed there somewhere. And it's interesting that we don't know what it is to experience something. We can actually be mighty mistaken when it comes to our own experience. Of course, it goes to say that Kant experienced a non-Euclidean space, because that's the only space there is. There isn't any, any, any other. You can't really have a Euclidean space to perceive. So actually, uh, the, the answer to the appearance, could it be deceptive or not? Well, I would say directly no, and then I would say yes. I would say no, because of course Kant in some way perceived space, because he moved around the streets of Königsberg. He went over the bridges, he had his daily exercise. And for him to move that way, he had to understand space, otherwise he wouldn't be able to move. You cannot move around Königsberg in this space, because it doesn't exist. It's impossible. So, in a way he was deceived. And the deception is not so much Kant himself, but more how knowledge was formed at that day, the, in the beginning of the 18th century in Königsberg. So here you see there is actually a timing to knowledge of space and room when it comes to the abstract. And that it could change, I think that's a very, very important lesson. Uh, why do I say that? Well, for one instance, we've been talking here earlier about a certain person who can't accept something to be existing and non-existing. And he says he cannot see something existing and non-existing at the same time. And as I just more or less indicated here, yes, that could actually happen. In a way, he's wrong. So what he's saying is what he thinks he understands. He thinks he has a perception, but that perception is not the correct one. I bet you he doesn't know about non-Euclidean space. Haven't you done uh, advanced mathematics? You don't know about it. But, in a way, it's not, it's not vastly complicated. In many ways, it's much simpler than this three-dimensional flat surface uh, space. But once you got used to this one, by growing up in a Western country, it is very hard to get rid of the ideas of space being completely flat in all directions. So, well, that leads me obviously into time, and I think most people today think that time is very similar to this, but is usually perceived to be one line going over the whole free dimensionality of coordinate system. But that's also not something you can perceive. This is impossible from the start. Space is the beginning of time. There is no other way of fathom time than just space. And therefore also time needs to be non-Euclidean. It cannot be coordinate system of three dimensions like Descartes thought. Or anyone else for that matter.
and what happened in geometry when Euclidean space came to the fore, when it came up. It was first, it was a big revolution and we changed everything and people got really surprised. And then uh, much later we start to look at what happened in antiquity. And that's very interesting because it seems that uh, the foundation of thinking that space was absolutely flat, that did not develop clearly. And that meant that you could actually partly have a non-Euclidean space out to a certain time era because you didn't put the foundation. Uh, for the foundation to be put properly, you need to have some sort of explication that you explain what the world is in a way that's mathematical and can make sense. And once you've done that, then this disappears. And that happens at a certain time instance. I, it's very hard to say what that should have been, but it didn't happen before 500 after Christ. It happened uh, somewhere after that time. So you can see how knowledge shuts itself and it opens itself. And sometimes it's half open. And this has to do with exactly the same problem I mentioned here. The problem with a round surface and a flat surface. Where is the flatness starting? Is it starting in this one or that one? Because this can only be flat in comparison to something else. And the Greek understood that because that was before the foundation was laid. Once that was laid, we started to perceive everything to be flat, like that was the natural order of reality. And then came Kant, and many other people for that instance too, he wasn't alone, John Locke said similar thing, who I'd say all educated people who read mathematics, maybe with a master or at some schooling system or at the university, that had, they had by then the idea that space was flat. And once that was firmly, firmly established, it was really hard to get rid of. And uh, there was even the tendency to people to shut that knowledge out from their own minds. We, I have a third example here to show you the problem. And that's with something being inert. You can also call it non-moving. Static. So inert, non-moving, static. This is one of the foundational problems in physics. Uh, and it, uh, when, for instance, the classical physics came, it caused a huge stir and uh, I am here referring to the bucket, the famous bucket, the bucket that needs some sort of original, original force of gravity. It needs to be centered somewhere so the uh, uh, gravity inside the bucket can be stable. There are several problems here, but one of the most interesting is the inertia. Where do we find a point that doesn't move? You can see, here I was comparing flatness to roundness. You can do the same thing with movement. You can compare stability, something being static, or something being inert to something moving. And in order for something to move, you think you need something to be completely static. So you can have an origo somewhere to measure that speed with. How else would you measure a speed? If everything is moving, you can't measure any speed. This is also impossible. It's as impossible as the space 
there are no inert points in the universe. Everything sort of is moving. But what does it mean that everything is moving? Well, it does actually mean, as I said in the beginning, in certain aspect you can say something is stable because we have a common sense use of the word. Something that we used long before these ideas were actually popping up. And then we could say, this is standing here, nowhere else, it's stable. But it's becoming a problem when we make something of this to be more absolute or foundational. Only then does the problem start. And here is the really interesting points. Let me get back to the roundness. How was it with mariners, sailors at the seas? Because they could be the only one that actually in ancient days perceived the round, uh, roundness of the earth to a certain degree, to some degree anyway. What is the reason for that? Well, the reason is the sea is an immensely flat surface, so to speak. It's complete flatness. There's no mountains, there's no trees, there's no valleys, there's no nothing. You just see straight ahead. And that means you can see so far as you can see a boat moving on the sea. And when it goes a little further, you will start to see that part of the sail is disappearing. And then a little bit more. And by then you can, it is obviously then the ship would disappear because it's going to be far away for you to see. It's going to be so small. But actually, the mast would disappear to a certain extent. So, could anybody ignore that? No. No one who sailed could ignore that. And that's been the case as long as we had boats long enough, big enough to have this phenomenon. And that's been going on since at least a thousand years before Christ. We had those big boats for a long time. So all those mariners actually to a certain extent know this property of space, this property of earth. And they made use of it. But if you would have asked them, probably they would still say that the earth was flat. And that's very interesting. I think we need to understand that there is an implicit meaning and there is an explicit meaning. I mentioned that before when we spoke about gravity. And we can have different explicit meaning and they are actually pointing to the same thing. And I think that answers the questions, <coughs> is the earth really round or is it flat? Well, it has the shape it has, but there are two explicate forms, at least. I even mentioned three here. The third would be the non-Euclidean earth that's not put into a geometry system. Well, we can skip that one because that's quite unusual, but the two first they will both be valid to a certain extent, although they would be uh, incommensurable. They would be excluding each other. But they're still pointing to one and the same Earth. And oddly enough, we need to know these things. They are really important, for otherwise we get stranded. Sorry about the joke. But we do get stranded somewhere and we start to think in certain cases that we should always say that the earth is flat or round. But that's not the case in this special case. In other cases, other rules apply. But they have to do with the historical development of the different explicate forms. So without knowing that, you can't say anything. And that means that an alien, he would never be able to understand that. It doesn't matter how close he look at us with his big uh, telescope or use microphones to listen to us. 
he can never understand that you can also say this is a sort of an embodied knowledge and what do i mean by that well think about the ancient mariner he was going to sail to england to get some tan that was actually what the um, the phoenicians did they were actually went to britain and they had mines there to get tan um, pewter it's actually called in english sorry pewter uh, imagine that the phoenicians going to england well we know that so they know somewhere that the sails disappeared and they made use of that. So they had an implicit knowledge of the earth being round. But would you ask the Phoenicians, is the world round? They most probably would say, no, it's not, it's flat. So the meaning of the Phoenicians saying the earth is flat doesn't really mean what we say when we say it's flat. It obviously has another meaning. But what that meaning is, we can't know, because we don't share the Phoenician's life world. We can never know that. And this is the point uh, that uh, Wittgenstein made, made with the lion. And that is, if the lion would be able to speak, like have vocal organs, we would not be able to understand it ever and the reason is the lion has a different life world it doesn't have human life world and therefore its language is different because it's intimately connected to what you do and since all humans are doing more or less the same thing we have mutual understandability but that doesn't go for a lion. If the lion was able to speak, it would not make any sense to us at all. We wouldn't understand what they were trying to say to us. Whereas they wouldn't understand us either. So we need to understand this concept properly. And why is it that I actually can understand somebody from Madagascar? To a certain extent. Of course there would be deviations, but that would be tiny. The reason is because there is a reality. We are all humans, whereas a lion is not a human. It's completely different. And that's have to do with how reality is. So you see here, reality and the abstract go hand in hand. And this is a little similar how mind and body go hand in hand. Mind can actually construct things like this. But how much they deviate from the world has to do with your own embodiment as well. And are you firmly grounded in the world? Are you a mariner? Are you a Phoenician who are working on, on a sailing ship trying to get pewter from England? It would not be a problem. To say to other people the earth is flat because that doesn't have the same meaning if I were a mariner today and I would be sailing and I would say to my comrades about well, the earth is actually flat that was completely different and uh, here we also learn something horrible there are no rules to reality not always all is exception and space is one of those it's not at all as regular as everybody thinks and we mentioned this we mentioned this about heisenberg's insecure uh, indeterminate problem and also the problem of existence in schrodinger's cat and when we come to john bell that everything is not made from the beginning in the universe determinism all these things shows that space has interesting, very odd qualities and we need to learn them. The only way to learn them is by encounter them with our bodies for one sake, with our minds for the second sake. Two different stratospheres and when they come together you have sort of a direction I mentioned before. Your sailing ship will actually go to England and you can have a 
whole ship cargo full of pewter you can bring it down to Byblos or Tyros or one of the other towns in Phoenicia to sell and you can get some nice wine from Lebanon or something like that. That's the life world you're living in and that's having a reality to their language. Language and reality are never separable, not completely anyway, but it can give that impression. I can understand, it can give that impression. And here is a very interesting twist I've been thinking about for a while to help the understanding here. Think about a unique feature in Europe, because we are Europocentrical. But there is a unique feature in Europe that's not shared by other places in the earth. And that is, we have languages in Europe that are all interrelated and rather close as well. And that's not the case in Asia, for instance. And that could actually be a source of trickery. Just because we can translate words it makes it even easier to get the idea that they actually monosemically corresponds to something of an outer world that is exactly the same for everyone. You see here how tricky it is. All the languages in Europe are interrelated, they are very close to each other, they form small states. Compare that to Asia. Either you have the case as in China, you have an area that is four times bigger than Europe and they all speak only one language. You see, there's much less risk of having that confusion. Uh, and then you can take the example of the rest of Asia, uh, Thailand, Burma, or India. All those languages are so different, there is no risk of having any correct translation that is worth the price. They are actually so different, uh, even the structure makes it impossible to have a direct translation. Most of uh, the tibeto burman language only have one syllable, instead they have a tone, and whereas the Indian language are usually syntactical. So it's trickery. Geography just plays a very big part, and of course on top of this who became victory of the world, victors of the world? It was Europe, with its closely interrelated languages, living very closely together, which even furthered the idea that every word had the same meaning, because maybe the same basis was transported all over, and the ideas came over border and border. Uh, so you see the problem here, and. Uh, Europe is also much more uh, intercorrect, in, interconnected because the commerce the Mediterranean gave uh, uh, sea to. There are actually authors who said the Mediterranean is one of the main causes for logocentrism. Mediterranean is unique. It's a sea that's not too big, not too small, to be completely covered by ancient traders, which made the idea you understood the whole world and you thought that was all of reality more or less. So uh, I think I round up here and I'm going to take some questions with Kalle if there are any a little bit later and uh, well go figure and I wish you a very pleasant good night. Thank you for the round up.